Hi, everybody. I was inspired by Warren Zevon just then. He's one of my spirit animals. Uh, I thank you for coming today. Um, what I'd like to say to you is that what you know about protecting critical infrastructure from cyber threats is potentially valuable and could be quite useful in the future for protecting those same infrastructure elements that we care so much about from what's coming at us from climate. By that I mean the fires, floods, freezes, and a handful of other forces that climate change is gifting upon us. And these things are not just in the future, they're already landing upon us and demonstrating their capacity to cause great disruption and great damage to infrastructure, to businesses, to human lives. So what I'm gonna show you today is show you that you have a role in this, this other threat vector that's coming at us, and I'm gonna try to enlist your help in it. So please pay very close attention. I'm not the only one in this room and elsewhere that thinks this is pretty fucking important. Here we go. This is the Bujigali Dam. It's a hydro uh, facility. It's about 60 miles east of Kampala, the capital of Uganda. It sits on the White Nile River and is fed by the mighty Lake Victoria. Last year, I was asked by the State Department if I would do some rudimentary cyber training for the operators there. If you know me, that's all I can do is rudimentary. I don't go deeper than that, but I know people who do. It's you guys. Um, so uh, we, they had just recently bought some automation equipment. They had other concerns. I think that's why they asked for help. So uh, I went over things with them, the basics, right? We did some segmentation, some least privilege. Pretty much the, the main thing I, I drumbeat on was uh, ransomware backups, really doing backups, really practicing restoration from backups, things like that, that people that don't go all the way and do. They responded back to me that uh, they have funding problems, they have staffing problems, these things that are, even in, in Uganda, there's the same issues as, as here and everywhere else, right? I tried to shore them up with some resources, so I said, here are some uh, documents that we can provide you uh, that will help you to do a better job. Some are from DOE, DHS, uh, from NIST, um, and um, uh, other sources. And they, they seem to appreciate that. When it was all over, I was explaining, pre doing pleasantries, saying, here's my email, you can call me back uh, anytime. And uh, I, I said, as I usually do in situations like this, this is a Zoom thing, right? I didn't say I was there in person. Um, is there anything else that's on your minds before we say goodbye? And uh, the team leader, Akiki, after a long pause said, well, um, the Nile's drying up. I uh, had no idea what to say to that. I have things to say for other things, but you're a hydro plant. You got no water. You have the threat of no water. What do you, what do, you do? What's your thing? So uh, there's the rub. There's the, the purpose here. So uh, a few years ago, uh, as in about 100, Sigmund Freud was talking and developing some new theories. One was called selective attention, and it had a companion theory called inattention blindness. Basically, what these things meant was, if you're really hardcore focused on something, like your subject matter expertise, the thing that you do and that you're paid to do and you care about, you might miss really big things that are just on one side or the other side, outside your peripheral vision coming in, because you're doing such a great job being focused and concentrating. For me, this thing all started to change in 2018. Uh, I was on a panel with the ambassador from Ukraine. This is Park City, Utah, by the way, the home of the Sundance Film Festival. And what did we do in 2018? Well, we were on the heels of 2015 and 2016, the attacks on their distribution grid first and their transmission grid the second time. We had a pretty, pretty deep, interesting, thought-provoking conversation. And when it was all done, I left the stage and was walking down a side hallway, and I came upon a gentleman who was in a, a couch. He was going over his notes. Assumed he was preparing for a talk he was going to give. As I started to approach him, he started to be familiar, and then I recognized him. His name was Jim Baylog. So I said hi to him. I said, I'm a big fan of your work. I had seen a video he had put together. He's a videographer, a nature and environmental photographer and video maker. And he had made a film called Chasing Ice. 
Uh, essentially what happened was uh, Jim and a handful of other folks went up to Iceland and put cameras on uh, different points around glaciers up there. They took still pictures for about a year. You know what happens when you take a bunch of still pictures in sequence and put them all together? Got these videos. And the videos were very useful for helping certain types of folks who can't otherwise understand things in science see that when scientists are telling them these glaciers are melting and moving and changing faster than they ever have before, chasing ice uh, shows them racing around. And you just can't believe it. And it's only one year, so it's absurd. That was about 12 years ago, I think, that video came out. Jim was there uh, because there was a world premiere of his latest video. It was showing the uh, effects on humans of the recent floods and fires that had happened in the United States with gestures to other places in the world, too. Uh, this stuff moved me. Perhaps you've had something like this in your life. I talked to other people at this conference. This was a futurism conference. And uh, after that stuff percolated at the end, when I you know, went out on planes and had time to really think about this, something crystallized inside me. And I said, I'm, I'm, gonna, dis I'm gonna add this. I'm gonna, I have a lot to go to school on. I'm gonna become someone who can be helpful for helping protect infrastructure, because I'm an infrastructure defender, against these things that Jim showed and that other folks at the conference talked about. So since 2018, I've been going to school. I've been trying to learn and fill my head with these things and eventually become somewhat helpful if I could. So the first thing you do if you're in the Department of Energy or somehow related to it in the labs or any other way is you're starting to think from a sector-specific point of view. You can't help but think otherwise, allowing for interdependencies, of course. And so I brought those risks and threats and impacts that, we, that I saw from Jim and from the, the readings that I had done, and I started to put it into a framework like this. And I've, talked, I've given talks about uh, any of these different three stubs uh, that are surrounding the transmission wire here. Uh, cyber, of course, is, is me, uh, my INL colleagues, lab colleagues, everybody here in the room from industry, and uh, we're working on big risks for cyber, right? Energy transition, uh, I've asked people here, and a lot of people aren't familiar with that term, but in certain circles they are, and it just basically means we're shutting down baseload generation uh, in the interest of climate mitigation, right? Fewer emissions hitting the atmosphere and causing the atmosphere to heat and the oceans to heat and uh, global weirding to ensue from all that stuff happening. We're shutting the firm baseload down, coal, uh, nuclear in some cases, and we're making it harder to stand up gas plants and we're standing up big wind and big solar, often backed by storage. Well, the problem is we're not doing that conservatively. And so that's why every spring, NERC now is coming out and saying, summer warning, reliability warning, uh, we may have shortfalls, our capacity, I think we overdid it. And every fall, like this last fall, they did the same thing, albeit different threats in different regions, but in this case, in the fall into this winter, it was pipelines, gas pipelines, going into the northeast, and how folks would have to make the cruel decision, possibly, of either heating homes and businesses or creating electricity, and not necessarily having an abundance to do both. So that's what happened there. And physical is the stub we're gonna, we're gonna drill down on here in just a second. The minute you drill down on any of them, though, you notice that there's whole universes inside of them. I'm sure you have this experience, too. So cyber on the strategic side, that is, as Piyush was talking about, that's more your nation state concern and your strategic level threat, been very focused on that uh, at the Idaho National Lab. Ransomware is the domain and really one of the best business models in the world if you want to be a criminal of uh, crime syndicates and other bad actors. And misinformation and disinformation, uh, I've come to think of as instead of doing this on digital things to make machines go bad or misoperate, uh, you're doing this and this sometimes to, to hack this stuff. And the, this stuff has profound effects if you do that, uh, if you do that right or do that wrong. Anyway, that's our cyber side for us. The energy transition has implications for planners who are using backward looking information to try to plan what they should do in the future. Siting, which in the United States anyway, it seems like we can't build infrastructure anymore because we just argue about it all the time. Transmission infrastructure in particular, I'm trying to say, and they have reliability, uh, profound implications for reliability, which you think we would, we would, that would be our most dear thing, our highest value, reliability and resilience of the most critical piece of critical infrastructure, and yet the way our system is, it doesn't quite work out that way. And physical side on the three stubs, kinetic, 
see Ukraine, talking with people, Tim Roxy and others, about what can you possibly do if your grid is under attack by missiles and bombs to try to keep it going, keep it more resilient, more reliable, architectural things you could do to distribute things, fewer big targets, more small targets. Those things are in motion. Crime and sabotage, I think you have a good feel for that with the ransomware, and we're going to go into climate. Uh, again, the old unpacking of the Russian dolls, right? So inside climate, and what are these, what are these uh, forces that are landing? Uh, I think you can read them all, even with a little bit of garbling. Uh, SLR is sea level rise. Some of these things are happening slowly but inexorably. Some of these things hit hard and fast. And all of them, depending where you are and what type of infrastructure you're operating or trying to defend, they all have hit infrastructure significantly so far. And um, we're trying to do something about it. We're trying to do something left of boom. Because what you keep hearing in the, the news is, there was a, a wildfire, or there was a flood, or there was a storm, and there was a freeze, and it was unprecedented. Could not have seen this coming. It was unforeseeable. Records were set. And uh, I, I appreciate that line of defense. It, it is true, well, those words are true, uh, that it is a record. However, when you say that over and over and over again, it's unprecedented. Face it, it's precedented. And uh, it, the onus is on you as somebody that does risk management and defense of infrastructure to not wait for those things to arrive now, but to project into the future and uh, do what's necessary to harden things in advance. I'll talk about that in a second. But ultimately, you see the term physical security. Maybe some of you have been in physical security or you know people, you have friends in physical security. Um, I always thought of them as our cyber cousins. They're over there and they've been reduced to the phrase gates, guards, and guns. And their job is to protect infrastructure when bad humans actually come running at it with pitchforks and things like that. Gates, guards, and guns. Uh, but uh, uh, a keynote I gave last uh, year at a grid reliability organization uh, coined the term physical security 2.0. It's a physical security threat to infrastructure for which gates, guards, and guns, no offense to them, do nothing. So what do you want to do about it? You're doing cybersecurity, you're doing traditional physical security. These things are coming at you. Do you want to pretend and hope and pray that they won't come on your watch, uh, assuming you don't have empathy for other people, right? So this is a beautiful substation. It's very important. And part of what makes this substation run, now that it's all become extremely digital and automated and dependent on software, are data centers. How many people have been in a data center? At least one or two or three or four or five or six. OK, good. A non-zero uh, amount of people. Depending on the lens you look at this picture with, you see different things, I would posit. If you're an IT-oriented person, you're seeing the physical manifestation of the cloud. You're seeing the smart grid and smart meters and everything else that has had the word smart prepended to it. Um, if you're aware that it's such an IT-oriented thing with so much software and communications, you see these rows and rows of servers, uh, your, your cyber spider sense goes off. This is a big, juicy target. And so we have cyber defenders, I assume some of you are thinking about and actually uh, protecting these data centers. If you're into power and electricity, what you see is an enormous source of load on the grid because it takes tons and tons of electricity to run the servers, to keep the memory going, and to power the cooling centers, the cooling systems that are just enormous depending geographically where these things are located, right? Physical security, back to the traditional one, take a look at a data center or go to visit one, and if some of you do, uh, you'll see gates, guards, and guns aplenty at these things. These are high value targets. And to climate change, uh, last summer, UK, uh, London had uh, temperatures of 104 degrees. They were unprecedented, unforeseeable, and they knocked out two data centers. Uh, one was Google and one was Salesforce, I believe. Why did those two data centers have to shut down? Because they were designed by real engineers using real standards so that they could handle extreme things, but not that extreme. Hadn't been seen before. And when they used their standards, which looked backwards at 50 year this and 100 year that, those things didn't help. Uh, the other data centers in the United States and some others that aren't in the press also shut down last year. 
And I'm, I'm a little bit wild, but I was thinking, you know what? If that's happening in 2022, and if you pay attention to the consensus in the IPCC reports, it's only going to get worse. We don't know how much, how fast, but it's never going to go the other way. Not in our lifetimes, not in your kids' or grandkids' lifetimes. It's going to get worse every year. Uh, I was inspired to do that and try to sort of jolt people awake a little bit with that graphic on the left-hand side. Uh, wrote a three-piece uh, future speculative fiction about a uh, heat dome landing on Ashburn, Virginia in the year 2025 and knocking out half of the data centers that are there. Heat dome's like a heat wave, but it doesn't leave. It's very rude. Uh, when that happened, Ashburn, by the way, has a nickname. It's in Northern Virginia. It's called Data Center Alley. It's the home, it's by far the largest cluster of data centers in the world, and everything depends on it. So that's your cloud, and your smart this, and your smart that. Uh, government applications and data in there. Banking is in there. Streaming video is in there, and games and all that. And uh, when this heat dome comes and sits and hits temperatures beyond what these things were designed for, uh, catastrophe ensues. Uh, trying to have people imagine it and feel it uh, before it actually comes so that they might do something prior. Uh, let's go back into our uh, more familiar zone for a second, cyber threat. Uh, here from the US-centric point of view, and if you're from other countries, you may put your adversarial stars in other places. Uh, but these are the big four. I don't think that's changed in the last year or two that uh, we spent a lot of time thinking about, preparing for, countering conversations earlier in this conference. When I start to think about ransomware, which in some ways is, uh, has had more impact than anything else in our, in our space, uh, th this is probably ineptly depicted, but the stars everywhere mean it's everywhere. You can do this from anywhere that you want. Uh, people that are good at it cluster in certain places, but it can pretty much come from anywhere. Chris Blaskett could come from sea as well, I imagine, uh, on your houseboat, but try not to do that. When we're talking, when we're talking about climate, though, uh, we have to look at things a little bit differently. We have to get down in a more granular, higher resolution view, geographically and temporally. So this is just one example out of thousands where I'm showing you that in approximately 30 years, and by the way, climate models do not predict the future, that's, uh, that's, that's uh, too high a bar to cross. They project likely futures, and they get better all the time as more information comes in. So this is a climate model projection, or data from one, that shows you that in 30 years, in 2053, places in red on this map of the continental US are going to be hitting 125 degrees for at least one day. 125 degrees. None of, none of, when I say none, I mean almost none. When I say no place is designed to handle that, that's pretty much the case, because nobody was seeing this coming and nobody built for it. So everything that's built now is not ready for that in those areas. And anything that's going to be built, better damn be informed by the fact that they can't just build it to be able to operate reliably. This is, right, this is communications. This is grid and power stuff. This is water and wastewater. This is transportation like runways better know that you have to build to a design criteria, a standard that hasn't been seen yet before, but it's quite obviously coming. And you can see that the other types of threats on the left-hand side, those two need to be thought about the same way and factored into engineering design, factored into RFPs, factored into standards in ways that they're totally not right now, hence this talk. Uh, the title of this presentation had the word nexus in it. And if you are going to do a nexus, you're going to have a Venn diagram. I mean, almost, almost guaranteed. I thought about not doing it, but I knew somebody would be let down, and I couldn't do it. So with time winding down, the left-hand the left uh, column, those are your familiar comfort zone of your NIST cyber framework. You have the OT cyber, and I really played around with these to make something fit semi-decent. Those are familiar terms from threat intel at the top to Monica Tigliano's cyber insurance at the bottom and everything in between. And the climate physical side on the right-hand side should be not as familiar to you because that's not your primary domain. In the middle is where I saw the, the convergence, where there are some things in that center that are common to, to, all, to both sides that are working these problems. And I've made it so I can tear through them really fast here one at a time. Prioritization by, prioritization by consequence in the identity identify bucket this just comes to me from uh, the past doing uh, CCE and CIE work, but it's something that regular people on the street can understand, which is 
you can't protect everything. You can't protect everything against the worst cyber threats, and you can't protect everything against the worst climate threats. So what are you going to do? You're going to protect the things that matter most, things the loss of which would be unacceptable. And that helps you figure out and winnow it down to something that's more manageable. So prioritization by consequence applies in both worlds. Vulnerability assessments, very familiar to people in cyber, coming on strong thanks to the United States government and FERC uh, and the SEC. You're going to be seeing climate vulnerability assessments I would assume going to be performed by large engineering companies. That's going to become a norm everywhere, and that's going to happen year on year. It's not happening big time yet, but it's certainly coming. Uh, hardening in the cyber world, we're talking about things you can do to make the adversary's job tougher, configuration uh, options, shutting down ports using least privilege. Hardening in the right-hand side in climate uh, involves raising things up in case they get flooded, undergrounding things. Sometimes ballistically hardening things when objects are projected, projectiles are projected to come at them faster than they ever have before. So we have hardening as a concept there, literally and figuratively. Information sharing, standards lagging, and risk transfer, uh, cyber insurance, and property insurance. And you can tell I didn't flip the slide, so watch, they're going to go now at the bottom. The thing with uh, cyber insurance is it's still something evolving, right? We got that from a couple hours ago, and we knew that before kind of anyway. Uh, with uh, property insurance, that's, everybody knows property insurance. If you have a house, you have a car, uh, then you know what that is. The thing is, when a big fire comes and burns down a community or a flood devastates someplace in Florida, if you have property insurance, you can potentially rebuild. Most people don't, and so they become technically homeless. And that's happening more and more. And the funny thing with humans and our species is that those that do have property insurance, they, they, they rebuild right where they just were. That's true in California, it's true in Florida. I don't understand those people, perhaps you do. Uh, maybe you're one of them, but I hope not. But that's gotta stop. That, we need to give some kind of incentive so that they don't, they don't follow that instinct to rebuild right where the thing happened. Coming down the home stretch here, I think three slides. Living in the past. The motto of this conference, uh, you've noticed, is create the future. I like to say protect the future, too, while you're creating it. But how can we do that if so much of our world is still living in the past? Two examples, right? Air gaps. You guys know that air gaps don't exist, but a lot of people don't, especially people in positions that, where they make decisions on the Hill in Washington and in the boardroom. To them, it's an easy concept to understand. Just keep it apart and you'll be safe. Until they understand, too, that there's no such thing as air caps, that's a problem. Another thing addressed this morning uh, and coming at you again over and over again is uh, secure by design, insecure by design, right? Manufacturers everywhere are still building things seemingly blissfully unaware that they're going to be living in a cyber-contested world their whole life, their whole life cycle. How can they do that? How can they even possibly think that? Well, if uh, DOE and Ginger Wright and the CIE program has its way, the engineers soon, pretty soon, will be thinking about cyber engineering options, engineering options to keep cyber more at bay as they build whatever product it is, because they're all computers now, right? On the right-hand side, we have climate physical, and the now similar to air gaps, I'm suggesting it's an anachronism. A 500-year flood is a thing. It helps you with probability until Houston floods three times with 500-year floods in three years, which happened a few years ago, then that term is nothing. It doesn't mean anything. And the fact that it used to make sense, and I'm not saying it never did, uh, that doesn't mean that we should keep using it just because we did before. Uh, and yet, living in the past, we're still doing it. That term has to go. There's one other thing I wanted to say on that slide, but I don't know how to reverse it, so I'll just say this. It's a repeat of the, the issue that we're building things the to 500-year floods and that none of the data centers and most of the energy uh, gear from the control centers to the substations to the gen plants uh, is designed to live in this world in 2023. And it damn sure isn't designed to live in the world of 2030 or 2040. And so that it all needs to be looked at to see whether what kind of retrofits or enhancements it needs if you want to keep it going, if you want to keep it reliable. If that's not a big deal, then don't worry about it. But everything is going to need that type of look. That's going to be a lot of money and a lot of arguments. We're going to have to have those arguments and get some of the money there. So here we are. 
I am not trying to convert you out of your OT security focus. It's just as important as ever, maybe more so, and it's still me too. I'm not switching teams completely. I'm just putting on an additional hat on, on top of that one. But we all share one thing in common. It's a term I've used to say defender DNA. Whatever your role in this is, whether you're a vendor or an asset owner or a regulator, some other type of stakeholder, we're trying to defend things that matter to civilization on which human lives and thriving depend and the future Dale is describing. We're trying to do all these things at the same time. We are aligned to protect. We are aligned, I would say, at an instinct level to protect, right? We have an approach, a proven approach that we know will work, that will help us do both of these challenges and address them as best as we possibly can, I would say with some success. What is that approach? With uh, thanks to Ron Fabella for the graphic and Dale for the stage and you all for paying attention, it's called engineering. Thanks for your time.